but he leads Marico as the chairman. He is also the chairman and managing director of Kaya Limited. Over the past three decades, he has transformed a traditional commodities-driven business into a leading consumer products and services company in the beauty and wellness space. Um, from a leading, uh, from a turnover of only 50 lakhs in 1971. Marico's products in hair nourishment, male grooming and healthy foods generated a turnover of 6,000 crores during 2016-17. And under his leadership, Marico has obviously won several awards and over 100 external recognitions uh, in the last few years. So we have him here for that, but also for his other two passions, which I'll talk about. His entrepreneurial drive and his passion for innovation uh, he set up, as a result of this, he set up the Marico Innovation Foundation in 2003, which Ashwin Bhai briefly alluded to in his opening remarks. Uh, and the foundation acts as a catalyst to fuel innovation in the country. In the afternoon, we're going to talk a lot about innovation. He also started at the Ascent Foundation in 2012, a not-for-profit expression of his passion to create a unique, trust-based, peer-to-peer platform for high-potential growth stage entrepreneurs that leverages the power of the collective and enables them to share and exchange experiences, ideas, insights, and cre create a healthy ecosystem to learn from each other and grow their enterprise. In fact, we have two of their members who are going to be presenting to us uh, in the next session, uh, our own Bhatiani, Mihika Sampat, and my good friend, uh, Asim Dalal. So, but we'll come to that later. So we invited uh, Harsh Bhai to share his thoughts with us. And when we were preparing for this, Ashwin Bhai, Harsh Bhai, and we had a chat and we said that we'd like events like today and GBF and uh, uh, become a funnel. So those entrepreneurs who meet Ascent's criteria for membership, that we can create a funnel into Ascent so their uh, community can grow and you can get the health and support, uh, the help and support that you need to grow your business because there's a very, very well-structured, very well-recognized program on global lines. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Harshpai Mariwala. Good morning. So I'm extremely happy to be here in front of all of you. Thanks Ashwin Bhai for calling me here. And congratulations for uh, taking this Global Bhatia Forum to a greater heights and I've seen this evolution over the last few years. I also spoke at one of the events earlier about one or two years back. Yeah. But I must congratulate um, all the organizers who put this together. And I think it's evolved very well and I see a lot more potential for this forum in future. So congratulations again. So I'm going to speak about my own journey and my own life, business journey in half an hour, which is a difficult <laughs> task to do. But I started off very young, at a very young age, at, uh, at the age of 20. I just finished my graduation from Sydney College in Bombay. And I, could, I wanted to do MBA, but I couldn't, I was not that bright to get admission into one of the MBA schools in India. At that time, we had IIM, Ahmedabad, Calcutta, and then Bajaj. <clears throat> I think there were three, only three MBA schools then. And I wanted to go abroad. My father said no. Being an obedient kid, <laughs> I decided not to go. But if I tell my children not to do something like that, they will never agree. <laughs> but those days, it was different, you know. So my father asked me to join the, the then uh, family uh, business company, which was Bombay Oil Industries. Um, and uh, it was a company which was managed by my father and my uncles, uh, three of my uncles, my father, and it was very much a family managed organization where most of the work was done by families. Uh, very few professionals, uh, no systems for HR or finance or so. There was nobody to train me when I entered and my father said, okay, you just explore, you know. And we had three different businesses. We had an edible oil business. We had a chemicals business and we had a spice extracts business and both were, all three businesses were completely diverse in terms of the kind of customers they had and there was no synergy amongst these three businesses. Um, so I was exploring and I just, in the first few years, I just started visiting factories and visiting customers for different businesses. 
And in that uh, journey of exploration, I realized that the edible oil business, which was mainly uh, selling edible oils in bulk to, um, to some brands which are based in, um, in Calcutta, Shalimar, which is a very leading coconut oil brand, which is based out of Calcutta. We were supplying them in bulk in tankers, railway tankers. And we were selling refined oils to paint industry, to uh, biscuit industry. We also had a very minute uh, branded business. Uh, and that time the brands were there, Parachute and Safola both. But nobody in the family was paying attention to those brands. Uh, the brands were selling in some parts of Vidarbha, Parachute, and some parts of Bombay, Safola, and Delhi. But it, the business was not going anywhere. And I was fascinated by that, partly because we were supplying to somebody else and he was making or they were making a lot of money in, in that business. So I said, if I can convert this business from unbranded to branded, then that will give a lot of opportunity for the business to become far more profitable, far more sustainable. And that's how my journey began in, in creating this business. Initially, um, I started traveling on my own. Uh, there were no professionals, so I had to do virtually everything on my own. I, I hired a car and went into those markets you were, which were selling parachutes, so Vidarbha markets, started from Nagpur and went to all the small villages, started appointing distributors and started retailing the products. And that was quite fascinating, you know, those moments of actually making a sale uh, were truly, I mean, <laughs> rewarding. It's, I still can't forget those, you know. Uh, so the business grew. Uh, I had to do it in small bites in terms of growth because um, one had to take, I mean, people were regarded those days as costs, so one could not add a lot of people. So I started with West and then went to south and then north and east. But it took me about five, seven years to create an all India distribution network. <clears throat> and then we realized that um, you're stagnating. We reached from a zero percent market share to or one or two percent market share to about 15, 20 percent market share in the coconut oil, pack coconut oil segment. And we said that if we can actually convert that business from tins, at that time the whole market for coconut oil was in tins to plastics, then that will give us a great opportunity to grow because plastics is cheaper than tins. It's more convenient to the consumers and it's also more attractive to look at. So we thought we had a winner on hands, but um, when we actually went to the trade and told them that we have this coconut oil coming up in plastics, there was a huge resistance from the trade because Apparently, about 10 years prior to us, somebody else had launched coconut oil in plastics. And they had done a shoddy job of packing it, a lot of oil coming on the surface of the bottle. A square-shaped bottle, when the retailer closed the shop in the night and opened next morning, they realized that the, all the bottles were bitten by the rats. And not only damage to the, to the product, but damaging the shop because of the oil spillage. So, we said, what do we do? And as entrepreneurs, as you would all agree with me, that we don't give up, you know. And I was not willing to accept no for an answer. So we went back to the drawing board, we went to our packaging vendor and told them that you design a bottle where the rats will find it difficult to get a grip. So that's how the round shaped bottle came in. And then we went to our packaging department and said that can you just ensure that no oil is coming out of the surface of the bottle. And with that, we actually kept those bottles in rat cages for a few days one or two days. Luckily nothing happened and we took pictures of that and again went back to the trade. So it gave us two things. One is inner confidence that this is working. So we could actually give an assurance to the trade that if there is a damage, we'll reimburse you. And the pictures also helped the trade overcome the resistance. So what I'm trying to say is innovation is, has a lot of rigor, a lot of execution. And it is just not ideation. And if we had given it up at that time, we would not have been anywhere. And that whole journey of converting the market from tins to plastics took almost about 
five years or so, and our market share just jumped up to about, we have become, we became a, became a clear market leader. And today the whole market is in, in plastics. But every month I would go on tracking what is the total contribution of plastics to the total sales of parachute and would have targets for everybody down the line. Come winter and coconut oil freezes in most parts of the country, except Bombay, because it's not so cold here. <clears throat> So we had a people would go back to tins. So again, we had to design a container which was a combination of, which was actually a wide mouth container with a spout, and people would then stay with that container uh, in winters. As the brand uh, became popular, um, as you all know, we have a lot of copycats in India. A lot of people want to uh, end cash on something which is popular. So we had a huge challenge, you know, we realized that in a survey done by Fiki in, uh, in in those days, we were the most copied brand. We had something like 100 copycats and we were losing about 20% of our sales to those copycats. And we said we have to do something. You can make complaints to the police, raid them, but when you have so many number of copycats on such a large scale, we said, can we do fundamentally do something different through technology route? So we went back, we went to a mold maker in, in, in Europe and told them to design a mold which was difficult to copy. So they came up with a mold which was a combination of a cap, which was a combination of pilfer proof and a flip top. A difficult mold to make and quite expensive those days. It costs, one mold cost us about something like two crores. And we launched that and then all of a sudden the copycats vanished. Though I must say it was a matter of time <laughs> that uh, Indian mold makers were able to make a mold at a fraction of a cost. But what I'm trying to say is innovation, you have to continuously go on working in innovation. You just can't say I've innovated and I will succeed all my life. Uh, so you have to continuously go on working at innovation on a perpetual basis. And our challenge in all the brands is how do we go on innovating regularly by adding new features, by doing new things? Because it's a matter of time, others will copy you and you have to be two, three steps ahead of others. And especially in these days when there is e-commerce, <coughs> modern trade, they all have the private brands. So it's very, very important that innovation becomes actually the centerpiece for each and every entrepreneur. And it has to be driven on a perpetual basis. Um, we increased our sale and, you know, in 1996 we went public. Um, and Hindustan Lever at that time had acquired Tomco, Tata Oil Mills. And in that acquisition, they got a coconut oil brand. They also acquired one more brand from the market. So they had two brands and they were riding very high those days. And they had given a huge fight to Colgate in the oral care segment. And they had taken a lot of share from them through their own brands, Pepsodent and Signal. And they actually were very keen to acquire us. Um, so that's why they acquired these brands and they went in their analyst meets, they went public saying that uh, we will, if we have given such a big fight to Colgate, Marico is nothing because we were, compared to Colgate those days, we were not as strong in terms of distribution and all that. And uh, there were a lot of fears in, in my field force. A lot of approaches made to me indirectly through merchant bankers and then nothing worked. The chairman of Hindustan Lever called me up on my phone. I never met him and said that, Mr. Mariwala, why don't you sell out? If you don't sell out, uh, you'll be history. But if you sell out, all your future generations will be taken care of financially. But I don't know what happened. I never thought I would sell because I'm not a serial entrepreneur who buys and sells businesses. I am I'm attached to my business, especially if I see a potential in that business. And clearly we thought that for us it was everything, our resource generating engine. And we knew this business inside out. For Levers it would be one amongst many other brands. And we also realized that they could score over us in two, three areas. One is in distribution. Second is the media spends. I mean, there was much larger company. And those days we were doing it on over about 600, 700 crores. So they could outbeat us in terms of media spends. So we took them on and we made improvements in four different areas, distribution. That threat of levers helped us go into rural areas and we actually expanded our distribution in rural areas. We also 
our price to earning multiple in the, in the capital markets fell dramatically. When we went public, it was like 13, then it fell to about six or seven because everybody thought that I was foolish not to take them on. Um, so there was fear and then also we had to not give a warning, but just give a cautionary thing that next one or two years we are going to take them on. So to that extent, our profitability may get impacted. Um, so we, they launched the product not once, but once, twice, three, four times. They got some market share, but not at our cost. They got something like 10, 12 percent market share. Our market share remained more or less steady. They got some market share from weaker players. And at some stage when they were stagnating, they started losing interest because by then the levers leadership had changed and it was very much a part of the uh, Unilever uh, integration. So they started losing interest in, uh, they started investing, stopped investing in advertising. And I had known the subsequent uh, chairman of levers and I said that, I, you know, this brand is not going anywhere. Why don't you sell it off to me? So somewhere, I mean, after one or two years of um, advocacy on the golf course, I used to play golf with uh, him. So, I mean, they, con they were convinced that they had to sell it off, you know. I thought it will come to me on a platter and they will offer to us and we will negotiate directly. But unfortunately, they decided to put the brand through an open auction. So, no, actually, it was a closed auction where... Most of the Indian players participated. So us, Imami, Godrej, Dabur, Wipro, uh, all bid for that brand. And we were very clear that we had to acquire the brand, come what may, because it, that brand, their brand was relatively strong in the East and we were relatively weak in the East. Uh, we knew this business, so we were able, we were sure that we were able to take out a lot of synergy through cost reduction in raw material sourcing. Um, through integration in the field force. So we just, we were very keen and um, when actually it came to bidding, my team came saying that others will not bid beyond a certain price. We, I mean, our valuation came to about 215, 220 crores. But we were saying that how much can we bid on 50, 160 because others may not bid. But when I went back to my board of directors, they said that you bid to such an extent that if you lose that deal, you will not regret. And that forced us to go all the way because I didn't want to lose that deal at all. And so we bid for that brand in 215 crores, way ahead of others, but it was okay because that acquisition has been one of the best acquisitions. Today we are making, a, in we acquired the brand in 2006. We are making a profit of almost 200 crores in that brand. So we actually bought that brand from them. And that was a great um, moment in, in internally because everybody felt so good from being selling out to MNC, we actually bought that brand. So let me now turn into the second part of my talk is what are my key learnings, you know, uh, in my journey. And I believe that for any business to succeed, uh, on a perpetual basis, you have to have a very strong right to win. Uh, because it is very, very competitive, the business. Um, and if you are a new player or even an existing player, you have to go on taking steps to improve your right to win. So what is the right to win? The right to win can be created in a marketplace through various routes. One is through innovations. So you have to be first mover and do something differently and that will help you create a right to win. Um, for example, in recent uh, past, about two years back, we launched the Sephora Awards. And we launched it in, um, in competition with the big players like Kellogg's and Quaker. Um, and we got again 10, 15% market share. Uh, very frustrating, we were not able to move our market share. And, we, for one, believe that whatever we do, we need to be market leaders. So if you look at our range of brands, in nine, most 95% of turnover, we market leaders. So in Oats, we didn't see any opportunity to become market leaders. So we said, we go back to the customer and we realized that the Indian customers like savory Oats. They don't like sweet Oats. 
normally when you buy plain oats, you actually make sweet. So we uh, came up with a range of savory oats, so tomato oats, pepper oats, and depending on the regional preferences, we had different options available in terms of taste. And we pioneered that concept and that market has grown quite well. Um, it's within two years become 100 crore market and we have a 70 percent market share. But because we pioneered, we were able to get that insight that the Indian customer likes savory tasted breakfast. And now our whole journey in oats is actually to convert that market from only a breakfast driven journey to a anytime oats. So now we have come out with uh, Italian oats, Chinese oats, so you can have it for a meal. And it's for a 15 rupees oat, you know, it's uh, 15 rupees, you actually is quite filling, you know. Um, so what I'm trying to say is innovation helped Safola because we thought it differently. You can also create a right to win by pioneering a concept. In our case, we pioneered two, three uh, brands, Revive, which is a fabric care brand. I was frustrated. I like starch clothes and, you know, those days every time I would tell my wife you have to boil starch and all. So it was like always not getting the right attention. So we came out with the concept of uh, ready to starch clothes through Revive. Even um, in a service business like Kaya, you know, we, um, we were pioneers in this business and because we took the first move, we created a right to win. Um, depending on the business, you can also create right to win through through acquisitions, through uh, like Rajubai and Jay have done, a lot of them. <laughs> and Jay will talk more about it in his journey, I'm sure. Um, it could be through some technology also, you know, you have some unique technology for which you got a patent and you create a right to win. In a service business, you, if you do a really top class, uh, give a top class service orientation, like in my favorite hotel is Oberoi, because their service level is outstanding, absolutely. You know, and I will not, if there's overall hotel, I'll always stay there, you know. So you can actually, you need to search for a right to win. It could be distribution also, you know, if you have, uh, but distribution can be caught up in uh, by others. So I think the key thing first learning to me is creating a strong right to win and go on refining that right to win on a perpetual basis. You cannot just say I've created a right to win, it will stay with me all the time. My second learning goes to people, you know. People have played a very, very important role in my journey. Um, I, for one, from beginning, have actually invested in people. In those days when we, in Bombay Oil Industries, we were located in, in Majid Bandar, and I'm sure many of you have gone there, the heart of commodity markets, but very crowded, and lots of hand carts and lorries, and I would call people to be interviewed, um, and half the time people would just run away. Huh? because they didn't want to get into a crowded office like a Masjid Bandar. So I again twisted the whole thing, started calling them first to, to the Billington Club. Nice surroundings. <laughs> and prepared them mentally one, two meetings, three meetings, and then told them, okay, this is the office, but it's a matter of time, we will shift our office. So I think that helped. And I think my journey has, from the time Marico started, it started in 1990. Um, it gave me a great opportunity to concentrate on consumer products and to me that was one of the biggest steps or the most important step I took in my journey because um, it was difficult to be a part of company which was which had three different businesses which had conflicts because of different strategies, different approaches needed to succeed in each business. And um, on top of that we had so many family members so that again impacted our um, are basically ability to attract talent. Um, so when Marico was formed, I the, one of the first recruits was head of HR, and um, he came from Asian Paints, and um, he was an XLRI graduate. And I convinced him that we needed good quality talent. It was very important for me to partner with him because no amount of me saying that it'll be a professionally run professionally managed company would cut ice as much as he would say being a professional and he also had very good networks in the professional community. So within a short period of about uh, six months or so we recruited some like 30, 40 managers at the top most and the senior most levels. And I realized that when you recruit people from 
different backgrounds within a short period of time, it becomes a melting pot of different cultures because each one is coming from his or her, her set of beliefs in terms of how the business should be managed, how people should be managed, what happens to a non-performer, somebody would say, let's sack him, somebody would say, no, we should train him, somebody else would say, no, we should be loyal to him. So there was no organization's way of doing things. And that uh, prompted me to write uh, my own thoughts in terms of how should we be dealing with people. Um, I wrote some like 30, 40 random pages and shared that with my team then and it evoked a very positive response then. So that led to our finalizing our values and that happened in the year 91, 92. Um, so we finalized our values which were broken up into three different segments, people, products and profits. And then we said what do we do next? Finalizing values is easy. I have seen in many organizations values pasted on in the reception. And when you actually meet somebody down the line, is this something which is being practiced? There's a lot of cynicism and I didn't want that to happen, you know. So, converting the values to a culture is, is a larger challenge. And I spent almost three, four years in doing that. I, the next step we took was to actually go to the next two layers of management and tell them that this is something which has been worked upon by me and my team but now we want you all to own it. So we actually presented the value document and then broke that, that uh, those people into small groups and they debated, dialogued and they again came up with more suggestions. We also asked them to come up with suggestions in terms of where are we lacking in values. So at the end of those two days, we had a far more richer value document, gaps we needed to fill. I think most importantly, I realized that when you involve people, you get their commitment, you know. I would have told them that this is something which I worked and you help us implement. It would not have got that commitment. So it's very important that, uh, especially in a culture building journey, the top senior management sends the right signals. If they stop sending or they send wrong signals, they said that this is the MD's values and I don't agree with it, then actually people, it will lead to cynicism. So we had a group of 30, 40 senior people saying that these are our values and that really helped us take this called culture journey for much in a much stronger fashion. So what next? We went to all the locations. We went to all the sales regions, international locations. We went to all our factories and in factories in the regional language, we translate those values, told the workers uh, what are our values and again had group discussions. So. The first phase was actually to bring awareness that what, what these values are. And we also told them that these values are an empowering values. You can actually take a step if you think that it is in the right direction of the values. How do you, uh, I'll just give you two or three examples of values and how do you reinforce them on a perpetual basis. One of our values is openness. So when you say openness, how do you reinforce openness from different angles? So we were moving into a new office then uh, in Bandra at Rang Sharda and then the whole brief given to the interior designer was that it should reflect openness. So everybody could see each other, including me. Uh, we also have an open house at all our locations. So every year at all our locations, including our factories, we have one full day session where we talk about our last year's progress, what are our plans for next year. So this happens after our annual results are declared sometime in May. And we also have an open house for two hours. And anybody can ask any questions to management. In the first few years, we got questions relating to uh, our salaries or this facility is not available. But now questions are more to how do, how do you improve organization's effectiveness? What are the innovations you're planning? How do you take on some competition? So that again promotes openness. We also have sessions where a boss goes with with his team uh, to an outside location for two days and talks about our relationships, not only between boss and the subordinates, but between the subordinates also. So again, promoting openness. We also send people to a training program, which, which is actually, um, which promotes openness. So when you reinforce pro openness from different angles, you, you create a climate of openness and then uh, a culture of openness. 
One more example, uh, one of our values is trust. So we said that how can we send a very strong signal of trust to people um, who are working with us. So we had to relook at some of our policies. We realized that this the leave which is available to our members, uh, there is leave and cashment and there is casual leave and there is sick leave and we said if we trust you, you will just get one type of leave and if you are sick, you are sick, you take it, you know, uh, we trust you. If you have some casual work, there is no, so we don't have any casual leave, we don't have any sick leave, we just have one leave which is the annual whatever holiday. We also ask all the members to maintain their own leave records. So they maintain leave records, they tell the boss when they want to leave, when want to go on leave. <coughs> Most companies when the members, they have to incur any expenditure for travel or anything on behalf of company, um, they have to go to the boss for authorization. We said, why do we have to do that? We trust you. We have a clear policy in terms of what are our policies on travel, staying, and you can self-authorize. So again, you do have a lot of bureaucracy. It improves speed and gives a very strong signal of trust. But we also mentioned to all our members that we will do some random audits. If somebody is misusing that trust, that person will be asked to go straight away. We have had some examples of misuse of trust, but the benefits of all these leave as well as trust has been so dramatic that it we get into a different kind of a, um, into a different type of, uh, shall I say, we stand out in the corporate world as, as a different kind of company. Um, so, so on and so forth. We also are believe that we believe that we have to drive innovation. So, how do you drive innovation? So, we have very flat organization structures to reduce bureaucracy. We, we encourage people to talk to each other. So you don't have to do it through your bosses. So, that's how, uh, and then we encourage people to experiment and take risks. And if somebody fails, then that person is not punished. Because if you start punishing failures, then people will stop taking risks. So culture is very important to any organization. It's, it acts as a source of competitive advantage. It helps attract talent. Uh, it helps retain talents. So I'm saying talent and culture has played a very important role in our journey. And it continues doing so. My third learning is in the area of growth. I think growth is very important. Grow, every organization has to grow. If you stop growing, it will start demotivating people. It will start not only own people, but promoters, people who are working for you, associates. So you have to have a perpetual growth and not growth which is going one year up, next year down. But it has to be also be profitable, you know. So over a period of time, growth has to be profitable. Uh, the biggest challenge is how do you create a growth mindset within the organization. And that growth mindset actually starts at the top, but you have to go on filtering down all the way to the bottom. So policies like pricing policy, ability to wait for a long period of time in terms of turnaround have played a very important role in, in Marico's journey. When we went to Bangladesh, um, we saw that the market was fully in tins and we had a great opportunity and we went there in the market, we converted the whole market from tin to plastic, a big market um, dominated by local brands and whatever innovation we did in India, we did all that together in Bangladesh. And we became a market leader. We have 80% market share there. And we are the largest Indian company in Bangladesh. But I'm saying that we went aggressively on growth and innovation. So I think growth is very important. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is governance, you know. Irrespective of the size of business, governance plays a very, very important role. If you're a public company, you get much more premium if you're well governed. And we've seen that in the market is differentiating very widely between well-governed companies and non-well-governed companies. So it's very important to invest in that. Luckily for me, from day one, I didn't have to go to Delhi because our sector is actually quite free from, uh, from government interference. So I, luckily, I didn't have to do any, uh, anything to influence policy making in Delhi and that helped me a lot. But governance goes beyond actually following the rules of law and tax compliances. It actually means that the organization's interest comes first, you know. And many times as promoters, we have conflicts with the organization's interest and the promoter's interest. So 
one example came in when uh, when we went public, the brands were owned by Bombay Oil Industries and actually they were leased to Marico and the capital markets didn't like that because they felt that if the Bombay Oil took away the brands, what will happen to the business? So that prompted us to go buy up the brands from Bombay Oil Industries, but we bought it at a very low, I mean they were sold to us for 30 crores and that time they were doing a turnover of maybe 300-400 crores. So we just sold it at a very low price because we thought the organization didn't just come first. So it's very important that the organization's interest comes first. Even when it comes to employees, I've had multiple times when my team has changed. A person has been very effective at some stage in my journey, but at some stage because of growth, that person is not able to cope up with the challenge of the business. And so what do you do in that case? You know, you reward loyalty or you ensure that you replace that person. And I'm very clear that, you know, you cannot have any weak performers, especially at the top levels, you know, because that weak performer actually, actually demotivates the other strong performers. So I'm not saying that that pers person should be asked to go and thrown out of the company. Give that person enough time to find some other option. Uh, help him find a job. Uh, be fair to that person in terms of whatever package you have to give. But you cannot, a weak performer cannot be allowed to continue. And again, goes back to my question of governance, the organization just comes first. So whenever there's a conflict between any stakeholder, uh, I always follow that principle. What is the organization's interest? Um, and I think that should, that should drive. I mean, a few years back, uh, one of my CEOs came to me saying that uh, I want to become the MD of the company. And at that time, I had not thought of stepping down as managing director, but I realized that if I didn't promote him, and he was a very good performer, he would have left. So I stepped down as managing director and I appointed as managing director. And looking back, I think that was a good decision. I took again that thing about organizational interest comes first. And it has also provided me a great opportunity to do new things, uh, freed me with a lot of time. So I've enjoyed this journey and I think these are some of my learnings. So thank you very much. <laughs>